Welcome to another episode of Data Privacy Unlocked. My name is Dave Stouts. Our guest today needs no introduction. He is, or at least should be, someone who every privacy professional knows. He is Colorado Attorney General Phil Weiser. Mr. Attorney General, thank you for joining us on the podcast today. Great to be with you, David. Thanks for the time. So let's let's dig in, and, and um, I kind of want to start here. I think it's fair to say that you and your team at the Attorney General's office are going to have a huge impact on privacy law in this country. Uh, but my sense from hearing you talk, I, I, I've heard you a few times now. A lot of people who are listening will have heard you at GPS last week, uh, the IDP's GPS. Uh, this is really something you're excited. You're, you're relishing this opportunity to have this imprint on privacy law. Uh, do I have that right? Yes. So let me give you a couple of reasons for that. First, here in Colorado, we're innovators. We developed the first system of regulated access to marijuana in a responsible marketplace, which has been a nationwide model that Colorado developed. On data privacy, California and Virginia did enact their laws before us, and we're approaching it from first principles. We'll look at what they did, but we'll also look hard at what we think makes the most sense knowing the nation is watching. What I would always emphasize for people is too often people focus on Washington, but on so many issues, cannabis, privacy, the opioid epidemic, Washington is not acting. Washington is not functioning. Here in Colorado, we are looking to develop regulations. We're setting up an enforcement system. And the goal is really simple, to protect the people of Colorado. So let me ask, and, and I know a number of our listeners will, will know this already, but just kind of level set at the beginning, the, the Colorado Privacy Act, and I think we'll call it probably the CPA, because we have to use acronyms in privacy law, as many as possible. <laughs> it, it requires your office to adopt, uh, you have to adopt rules on the universal opt-out me- mechanism, that's required, but it gives you permissive rulemaking as well, uh, general permissive rulemaking and specific with respect to issuing opinion letters. We've had one of the bill sponsors, we had um, uh, Senator Rodriguez on our podcast before, and it's my understanding with talking with Senator Rodriguez that this was something your office wanted. You you wanted the opportunity to to do rulemaking. Do I I have that right? And if so, why? Well, first off, I'd say it's impossible to deal with an issue this complicated and not develop ongoing rules. The risk of any technology regulatory system is it becomes antiquated can actually become counterproductive. So without rulemaking authority, the legislature would have to revisit this law on a regular basis. I don't believe that's sound lawmaking because the legislature does better work when it does high level principles. We're an expert agency. We've got some really extraordinary professionals that we've put together building a impact team. So we need this as a way to keep this system dynamic and to capture ongoing learning. Because even as we do our first regulatory Uh, process, we know it's not going to be a perfect outcome. We know we're going to have to come back to it. So in short, uh, you've got three ways you can update rules through a regulatory process, through litigation, or through legislation. Of those three, the rulemaking process is the one that can move most quickly and allow for the most ongoing improvements. And so it's better to legislate at a higher level and then get the details in rulemaking And to the extent that people don't like the rules we adopt or think they don't follow the legislation, that they, of course, can take it to court. That's great. And um, and I I do want to make sure we get I don't want to bury the lead here, uh, which I've been accused of doing before. Uh, But you published last week or 10 days ago. It's it's April 22nd now and on April 12th at uh, GPS in in, uh, the course of giving your remarks there. Um, your office published pre rate pre rulemaking considerations for the Colorado Privacy Act. It is. Eight topics. It is 44 questions. <laughs> I've counted them up. I identified the ones I think we'll try to weigh in on. Um, and you've invited interested parties to comment on those topics. W- what are you hoping to receive back from uh, from interested parties? What, what are you guys looking for? Well, first and foremost, we didn't mean to suggest that those are the only questions. So if people have additional questions we should be thinking about, they should let us know here's a really important issue. And this always comes up in informal conversations. This is creating a little structure around the process. Our goal is to have this process be as thorough, as transparent, and as wide ranging in terms of engaging with different groups as possible. The unique step we took here is we we didn't go right to the rulemaking. We had, as you put it, a pre-rulemaking process to enable groups, individuals, 
to raise questions for us, to raise ideas for us, so that when we come up with our official or formal rulemaking document, it's really well informed and well positioned to come up with answers that had we just started with the rulemaking right away, we might not have been able to address. Yeah, so maybe you can lay out, and I was, was going to ask you this um, in the context of this question, the, 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 the pre-rule rulemaking considerations, you have these questions, you're looking for feedback. Do you have an understanding of, of when people should be aiming to get you any feedback that they want to get you in response to this, this pre-rulemaking? The sooner the better. So we've created a web page where this document and other information lives. It gives people a chance to share ideas, let us know about their feedback. And then as we have a set of questions that may come out further, we'll try to surface them for the public so that there can be ongoing dialogue. The sooner someone joins this conversation, the more they can help shape it. Yeah, and I think it'd be useful too to kind of lay off for our listeners. I, mean, I know at Privacy Day back in January, you said um, that you hoped by that time next year, so January ish, 2023, you were hoping to have the final rules done. Is that still the plan, give or take? Yes. Okay. Yeah. The, the formal legal requirement in law, I believe, is July 2023. Um, we would like to finish in advance of that. So we're shooting for getting the rules done by January. It, it would be helpful. That'd be great. Um, <laughs> California is the opposite. California blew that by, <laughs> by some time frame. So sooner better than, rather than later would be great. So then, then working backwards, right? So we've got we've got the pre rulemaking activities now where you're soliciting comments. You've got like by January you want to be done. What, what happens in the middle? What's that process? What people may or may not fully appreciate is the team that we've put together is an interdisciplinary team. And this is worth emphasizing. When you're regulating technology, you need to understand how technology works. You need to know technology is changing. So we're asking what goals we're we trying to achieve. What are the options to address them? What guidance can we give to consumers about how they're protected? What guidance can we give businesses about what it means to comply? So we're going to work through that process. And the goal is when we come out with the rules, businesses can say, okay, I understand. This is straightforward what I need to do. Consumers can say, I understand what I need to do. The success of doing that is going to require a lot of work. So right now, our team is hard at work moving this ball forward. When we release this formal rulemaking document, that's going to reflect a lot of work. And then to get from there to final uh, rules and our explanation of them is also going to take a lot of work. So th this next year, or even I guess now we're down to whatever, uh, eight months, uh, it's going to be intense. Um, we've got a lot of work to do. And the, the good news is uh, it's not really me. I'm, I'm providing broad uh, sort of leadership or vision. It's, it's the team. And we've got a great team, and we're fortunate to have them on board. Just so listeners who may not be in Colorado would know, you've 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 hired on to the staff at least two attorneys, I think, um, to to sort of uh, augment the existing expertise that you have within the within the office. Do I have that right, or am I missing something? Well, let me let me give you a little more of the lens. Um, my chief deputy, Natalie Hannon Lay, has a background in technology law, and she put together what we've called a privacy and security impact team, which includes those who advise the state as to how the state complies with issues because we want to eat our own dog food, those technologists who help us in the Department of Law manage information with respect to data privacy, data security, and those who are enforcing the law as to businesses. Um, we've hired two lawyers who are going to be um, uh, really the engine for this, but they are working as part of a broader team that has integrated our legal and our technology and operational savvy. So it is a team effort. And this is something that, again, we think is a model of how government should work. And, and if memory serves to it, 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 privacy day during the keynote, um, uh, you're also going to have uh, Paul um, is going to help you with this process as well. Is that, is that still the plan? It is the plan. For those who know Paul Ohm, you know what a treasure he is. I have the benefit of background in this area. Um, I taught a course on privacy, security, and digital rights management 20 years ago um, with Phil Gordon. He, he really taught me is how that all worked. And I recruited Paul Lum, who was an expert in privacy, I don't know, we're talking 2005 or so, to the University of Colorado Law School. Um, together, we worked on the Silicon Flatiron Center. He hosted many conferences on privacy. 
And so as we got this responsibility, it was a very easy call for me to say, Paul, we could use your help as a consultant. And he happens to be on sabbatical and he agreed. For those uh, listeners who may not be in Colorado, uh, Silicon Flatirons is a, um, what's a sort of a quasi think tank, or you can do a better job explaining it than I can, that's that's operated out of uh, uh, University of Colorado School of Law. But have I done a good enough job? Of some yeah, think yeah. tank is a great, I mean, I think it is uh, a tribute to Silicon Flatirons that it's not as easy to describe. A think tank is a good shorthand. We held regular conferences, the intersection of law, technology, and entrepreneurship. I could go a little further and you could call it a do tank because there's also a lot of active engagement, including a clinic. And we also had some very interesting issues that came up on business ethics and privacy that we'd host a regular um, challenge every year. Uh, But the spirit of Silicon Finance is to get people together who are across academia, business, government, nonprofits, to get people across different disciplines, technology, business, and law. The theory being that's how you solve problems. And so that's the spirit of Silicon Flatirons. And that's the same spirit we're going to use in this rulemaking process. Yeah. And, you know, just to sort of editorialize a little bit, but it, it, it's really one of these situations, right? I mean, as, as Mr. Attorney General, as you, you explain your background and everything you've done, it's almost as if like the right person ended up in the right position at exactly the right time with respect to <laughs> what you're going to do in the next year. I mean, this isn't your first rodeo in technology and privacy. No, it's not. It was a decade ago I was working with President Obama on a privacy bill of rights. When I ran to be attorney general, I was not running to be implementing one of the nation's first privacy laws or to be the lead lawyer suing Google for antitrust, um, which has a heavy privacy data set of issues. But here I am doing those things. And the great news, again, is we've been able to build a really special team to help us do it. And that's part of how I think when we look back at what we're able to do and you look at other leaders, it's, it's really about building that team. And the team that we had at Silicon Flatirons remains a model. As I think about building high functioning teams, the interdisciplinary element is critical, the commitment to dialogue and problem solving. And I will tell you that is actually the same spirit. And we could have had this conversation about water um, or about the opioid epidemic, right? If you're in the opioid epidemic world, you're talking to physicians about addiction medicine. You're talking to public health experts. You're talking to law enforcement. If you're in the water world, you're talking to engineers dealing with hydrology. And you're talking to people who are looking at infrastructure. Any challenging problems in the 21st century requires interdisciplinary teams. And this is an area that actually is deep in my background. But that spirit of interdisciplinary problem solving is something I take to all the areas we work on. So I want to I want to pivot a touch and and talk about maybe um, some of these topics. Just just touch on a few of them uh, that that's in the pre rulemaking considerations. But uh, before I, I I do so, I, I think something that, that you said at GPS, and I, I think it's reflected in the document in the in the the principles, right? The principle guided rulemaking, right? I want to give you an opportunity to, to talk about that because my sense of it is is that your um, motivation here, your goal here is not necessarily to come up with, you know, you company must do X, Y, and Z. Instead, your your goal here is to have a, a more principled, you know, a less prescriptive approach and a more principle-based approach to these regulations. Do I do I have that right? Have I gotten that yes. wrong? It's okay if I have it wrong. I get not no, no, you got you you got it right, David. Let me let me explain for folks who may not be as in the weeds. As a matter of regulatory philosophy, you have two high-level choices. One is you create principles or standards to govern conduct that leave some play in the joints, or you have prescriptive, in some cases, highly prescriptive rules that might literally tell you when you're managing a data set, you have to categorize it into these 10 specific categories. Now, the problem with a clearly prescriptive regime, 10 specific categories, is what if those aren't the best categories? Or what if it's different in different industries? Instead of setting up the standard or the principle, which says you have to give users a reasonable basis to understand what type of information you're capturing, you say instead you got to give users a matrix with these fields. The risk is the regulations will become immediately antiquated, counterproductive, and or confusing. And you lose the play in the joints. You lose room for experimentation. I recognize every state will have to make their own philosophical choice as to how they will lean on that point. And in some areas, prescriptive rules may make a lot of sense. 
So I'm not saying we would never do them, but as a general philosophy, I do think in an area like this, you're better off with a principle-based approach rather than a prescriptive approach. So let me, let me ask you one other, uh, I mean, about that, right? Because I think you can look at the, the CCPA regulations that, that came out a couple years ago now, really prescriptive, right? I mean, it's, you know, lengthy prescriptive requirements, you know, you must do X, you must do Y, you must do Z type of approach. It's not going to be lost on our listeners that Colorado and California are going to be engaging in rulemaking. It, it would have been California goes first and then Colorado goes second, but now it's going to be probably the same time, which is petrifying for people in my, in my position that we're going to have sort of this type of rulemaking going on at the same time and, and, and potentially same topics. So you've identified dark patterns, CDPA has identified dark patterns, the list goes on. How do you anticipate dealing with that issue, if at all? Will you talk to the AG's office? And, I'm sorry, to the CPPA in California, interact with one another, try to figure out what people are doing, or is it just, we'll do Colorado, they do California? One of our core goals is to enable Colorado system to be interoperable with other systems, most notably California. Now, that doesn't mean that Colorado has the same approach. So, for example, we may have a standard of how to handle something, and California may require a prescriptive rule. The prescriptive rule could meet the standard, but we're not the ones requiring that. That would still be interoperable or compatible. What we want to avoid is the system being incompatible with another system such that literally compliance with both is impossible. The way we would avoid that is going to be through dialogue with them so as to make compliance as feasible as possible. The aspiration I have, which I think is reasonable, is we're going to look to California for ideas. They're going to look for us and that they may adopt principles based on that conversation. And we may adopt principles so that uh, the spirit, and, and I've seen this in other contexts, can and should be one of harmonization. We have a shared goal in getting to the right answer through dialogue. We have an opportunity to do that. and. Again, if this works as it should, we will make compliance um, feasible and we will not make it infeasible. I think for listeners who may, may not have heard you speak in the, in the past, I mean, you've, you've got a very practical, business savvy approach um, to, to your running of the, the attorney general's office. I think that's a, a, um, an accurate description. You don't want to make things impossible for businesses, but you also you have a role to, to protect consumers in your position. Is that fair? That's very fair. I, I would say. Here's the critical point. If businesses don't understand what is required of them and they are not able to develop systems to comply in order to protect consumers, you are risking either setting traps for the unwary or businesses who just can't do it. And then you're playing this game of gotcha. But that doesn't, to my mind, serve any goal. By contrast, if you're able to provide a clear message to both businesses and consumers, you can better enable compliance and you can better meet the goal of protecting consumers. Put one other way, I don't believe that simple, clear rules that are easy to comply with, that protect consumers and enable innovation are at odds with one another. I believe we can do all those things and that is our goal. So me, I, I um, said I asked you about specific topics and I did the exact opposite. Um, so maybe I should actually um, get, to, get to a couple of specific topics. And it's outlined, you know, uh, you've got eight topics in uh, the pre-rulemaking one. I just want to ask you about a couple of them, maybe maybe a third. Pro profiling. Profiling is, is one that really caught my attention. This is not something that was done in, in California before the, the, the Colorado Privacy Act will have the right to opt out of profiling. Right. It's a new concept. And some can argue that the, C, uh, the CPRA will have this. It is in the regulations. Uh, but this is really hard and fast. It exists in Colorado. Um, and you have a number of questions in uh, the pre rulemaking activity talking about profiling and legally or similarly significant effects. Right. And I don't need you to get into the weeds on, you know, what you expect profiling to be or not to be, but this is this is a tough question. Is um, do you have an idea of how you're going to tackle this or what you're going to look for with respect to this? Let me answer the question in a way that I hope people have uh, some basis to understand. We are starting from how do we protect consumers and how do we design systems that protect consumers? 
the reality for consumers is all sorts of data is being collected about each of us, whether we know it or not. That collection of data can have very clear and in some cases harmful impacts on how we are treated. And we need to put consumers in the driver's seat. One analogy to this point about the data that's collected is the Fair Credit Reporting Act. There's credit data collected about people. There's a regulatory system that protects people, gives people some level of awareness, and in some cases even control, so that they're not essentially misprofiled or misrepresented. So as we think about this, and I'm answering the question at a pretty high level because the details are going to be a lot of work for the team, we want to ask the question, how do we best protect consumers? What do consumers need and expect and deserve so that they aren't feeling like all this is being done to them, but they've got some awareness and they've got some control? Thank you for that. I mean, it is, like you said, it's, it's just going to be, it's going to be tough. It, it, this topic is, is really going to be an interesting one to flesh out. The, the, another one that comes to mind is dark patterns, right? And, and you know, because that is so difficult because it, you don't know it until you see it, right, with, with respect to dark patterns. I imagine that that's going to be an area which you will be less prescriptive and more principle-based in your approach to dark patterns. Because I think you and the AG's office will really be tackling, or I'm sorry, you and the CPPA in California will both be tackling this issue and having your hands full trying to do so. Let me say a few things on this point. First, like I just said about the data sets that are built about consumers, you don't get the goal of giving consumers choice. If when consumers are given choice, it is so misleading and unfair that they don't even understand the choice they're making. So in order for the choice to be real and meaningful, you can't use these so-called dark patterns leading people in directions that they never would have wanted, but you basically misled them there. So that's the broad principle that we're wrestling with. As you note, specifically, you could address this through a more prescriptive or a more principle-based. I put my cards on the table about where philosophically we start. I also want to acknowledge that there needs to be some room for experimentation and innovation. Our true north, however, we deal with this under our consumer protection law, is are you playing games? And if there are businesses who are trying in good faith to follow the law, we are going to be sensitive to that. By contrast, if there are businesses who are trying to play games, trying to undermine the consumer protections of this law, um, we're not going to be all that sympathetic, and we're going to be taking uh, them to court if need be and holding them accountable for any such misbehavior. And one more specific topic then to talk about, and I want to ask you about uh, the emergence of other state privacy laws, and then there, given uh, the timeframes, um, the universal opt-out mechanism, right? Um, lots of questions in the pre rulemaking about the universal opt-out mechanism. Um, how do you intend to approach it? I mean, this is a tough issue, too. I mean, it's, you know, GPC was recognized by the AG's office, but this is something different. Um, what's your thought process? We involve technologists in that uh, in trying to figure it out. Because for lawyers, it's sort of like call the carrier, right, when we get into universal opt-out mechanism. Uh, so I guess how will you tackle that is my question. We talked earlier about the commitment to interdisciplinary problem solving. This is a great example. You can't solve a problem like universal opt-out without understanding the technologies available. And one of the challenges in this area is what role does regulation play in pushing the development of new technology, in uh, celebrating new technology, or in being limited by available technology. So it is a puzzle to think through, and it's not necessarily a one-shot deal that we can just declare victory and we're done. It's gonna be an ongoing project of, again, True North is how do we make it easy for consumers to protect themselves? This is an important tool that we're gonna put a lot of effort into figuring out how to make it work best for consumers. And so last question before I before I let you go, um, and you touched on this earlier, but I just just wanted to kind of approach it a little bit differently. We've got now laws in California, Colorado, Utah, and Virginia, as we sit here on April 22nd, Connecticut's got a bill through the Senate and it's calendared in the House, so we'll see what happens with that next week. Um, We'd have five states, you'd be one of five states. Um, Obviously that creates a lot of interoperability. I I never knew that I would use interoperability like every other sentence in my practice, but that's now the buzzword of privacy law. It creates a lot of interoperability um, challenges. Um, At GPS, you were asked, you know, would you like create like a chart of like mapping out if you do X, Y, and Z? 
would that, you know, under CPRA, would that match up with Colorado, those types of things? That's not my question. My question is, is essentially like, I imagine you see this, right? And you see the challenge that it is for, for businesses as all of these new laws come into effect. Have, have, has, have you guys thought about how you'll approach this, right? Like businesses driving compliance of multiple standards, even international, when you get GDPR into play and, and how that you'll, you'll, you'll try to uh, accommodate that for businesses. If at all. I have thought about it. When I was working in the Obama administration, the antitrust division, I was the deputy assistant attorney general for international, where we had the project of harmonization of antitrust laws internationally. And they're both procedural and then substantive requirements that come into play. We are going to be mindful of those. We're going to work with our fellow state authorities and enforcers so that we can create the most compatible, interoperable system possible. And it's going to be an ongoing project because there'll be new states coming on board. It's really important that we keep that in mind and that we avoid what I know businesses are afraid of, that they're basically, I can't comply with both these laws at the same time. So we got work to do. Uh, it's been done in other areas. We as states have worked together in other areas. We'll do that work just fine here. Mr. Attorney General, uh, thank you again so much for your time today. Um, it's been enlightening to have you work through this whole process for us. And we are, uh, the, the listeners and myself, I, I think, Fairly say we are very anxious to see what your office will be doing over the next few months and very much looking forward to um, having you engage in this process. Well, thanks for helping get the word out. We need people's thoughts and ideas. I want to thank everybody for your time and engagement. If you want to learn more, it's coag.gov backslash CPA. Tell us what you're thinking, learn what we're doing and help us do the best we can.